Drakengard 3 is an incredible leap forward for the series. It's easily the best game in the main Drakengard lineup. It takes the ideas that the original two games had and pushes them further. The combat is now actually playable and can be quite good at points. It's a fun system, doling out pain to hundreds of enemies around you, defeating bosses that are double or triple your own size, and with enough variety to keep you interested. It's exactly what the first two games wanted to be, but couldn't exactly make work at the time. And on the other hand, the story is fantastic. It can be a little trying at times. Its ambitiousness seems to get ahead of it at certain points. But overall, that same ambitiousness delivers some very unique and subversive themes that you don't often see in video games. The characters are well thought out. The world is grandiose, with lore that tries to wrap up this world neatly and create an origin for this universe, while not filling the game with references from previous entries. On top of that, the way the game's story ties in with the gameplay is just perfect. The two work in tandem, bouncing off of each other. They both give the other a reason to exist, and if one was different, this package wouldn't make sense. These aren't the only things about Drakengard 3 that really work, but that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to be taking a deep dive into Drakengard 3. We'll be talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Drakengard series, you should probably go watch those now. It's not entirely necessary, as this is a prequel to the first two games, but it will make more sense if you have the context of those games fresh in your mind. Also, if you enjoy the video, be sure to like it and subscribe to the channel as it really helps me out and will ensure that I can keep making videos like this in the future. You can also subscribe to the Patreon where I give early access to my videos, text post updates, and longer versions of my full series retrospectives. You can follow me on Twitch as well where I stream games that I'm not currently reviewing. Spoilers for Drakengard 1, 2, and 3. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son. And today, I'd like to talk about Drakengard 3. After Nier was released, the spin-off of the Drakengard series, Kavia was disbanded and merged into another developer slash publisher, AQ Interactive. AQ Interactive actually was defunct shortly after this, but had made mostly games for the Japanese markets. They focused on puzzle games, pachinko simulators, and some fighting games. They even released a game called Higurashi no Naku Koro ni Jong, which was a Mahjong version of Higurashi When They Cry. The idea of Drakengard 3 had begun after the second game was released. At the time, Takamasa Shiba, returning producer in the series, didn't want to make a game for the PS2, which was about to become obsolete with the new PlayStation console around the corner. The ideas brought up for this sequel actually ended up being near, but the team returned to the idea of making an actual third entry in the Drakengard series once that game was released. But because Kavia was gone at this point, the team decided to use a new developer to work on the third entry. It wasn't really a concern that the original studio wasn't working on the game because Yoko Taro was returning this time around. The team felt that as long as they had Taro, they could still make Drakengard games. Shiba and Yoko Taro eventually ended up choosing Access Games to take on this project. At this point, Access Games had worked on Deadly Premonition, a few Ace Combat games, and some scattered action titles. They were specifically chosen because Taro and Shiba thought that they made good action games. With the previous games in the series having notably atrocious action gameplay, they wanted to choose somebody who already had experience in the genre to really get the action right this time around. Shiba was really focused on creating a game for hardcore gamers. He felt that not enough games in the market were targeting this audience. It was an untapped market in his eyes, and he felt the need to tap it. He realized at some point that this market was growing, not shrinking, and audiences were clamoring for something like the older games that they used to play, not the ones that they had now. Overall, because Drakengard 3 was a prequel, it was ultimately geared toward new fans, but the team still wanted to cater to the people that had been with the series from the beginning. 
Along with the action being a main focus of the development on the third Drakengard game, the team also wanted to pay special attention to the aerial combat for this entry. It also seems like Access was a great fit for this because they had already made multiple Ace Combat games, which gave them more experience in that genre. Kimihiko Fujisaka returned to the series. He had been the character designer for the first two games and would take up this same role once again. He stated that he designed the characters independent of their personalities. This is because he would design characters and then Taro would specifically make the characters' personalities the opposite of how they looked. With the previous game's character designs being focused around medieval Europe, Fujisaka tried to go a different direction this time. He wanted characters to have a more modern feel and leave the NPCs and enemies to have the medieval Europe look. Many wondered and speculated about the reason for the main characters being female in this entry, and Taro really said the only reason was because all of his other ideas were scrapped. He didn't think that the gender of the character affected the plot whatsoever. Music was also a big focus for the team in this entry. Kaichi Okabe, who worked on the music for the first Nier game, had returned to score Drakengard 3. He wasn't involved in Drakengard 1 or 2, so he wanted to stay away from copying the soundtracks of those games. But he also couldn't make something similar to Nier, because Taro specifically requested that this OST be distinct from that game's soundtrack. The result then had to be something completely original for the series. They ended up making something much more intense than what the first two games, or Nier, had to offer. The main theme of the game was sung by Er Eoi, who was actually a massive fan of the Drakengard series. Shiba felt that this was a huge plus because it meant that the person behind the main theme truly understood the series from the ground up. Yokotaro was clearly the man with the plan behind this entry. It seems like most entries are really spearheaded by him, and he's generally given a large amount of creative control. Because of this, I want to quickly focus on this specific interview that he did before Drakengard 3's Western release, because it really sums up a lot of the thought behind the game, and honestly explains Drakengard 3 really well. It's a little long, but bear with me. Taro first begins by talking about the limitations of gaming. One of these restrictions, or invisible walls, is the demand to create games in which we kill things. That's the objective for a massed majority of games out on the market. If we're not killing, we're gaining an advantage over someone. What do we do in sports games? You defeat your opponent and strive to become the champs. It was about 10 years ago when we were working on the original Drakengard that I thought about the meaning of killing. I was looking at a lot of games back then and I saw these messages like, you've defeated a hundred enemies or eradicated a hundred enemy soldiers in an almost gloating manner. But when I thought about it in an extremely calm state of mind, it hit me that gloating about killing a hundred people is strange. I mean, you're a serial killer if you killed a hundred people. It just struck me as insane. The vibe I was getting from society was, you don't have to be insane to kill someone, you just have to think you're right. So that's why I made Nier, a game revolving around this concept of being able to kill others if you think you're right. This whole time, I've been thinking about these games in which we kill, and looking at the world, the gaming industry, and my own work after making the third installment in the Drakengard series. I have to say that there has been no revolution or great change. I perceive that as a failure. At least for me, it's a personal failure. But, I say but, because I remain convinced of the tremendous potential in games. I think the hidden barriers are many, and various visually and functionally, especially regarding the limitations in having to kill in our games. Perhaps the solutions to breaking through such limitations may not be found in a place like Japan, where it's relatively peaceful, but in countries that are more directly impacted by terrorism and war. What I would really like to see is for game developers to not take these limitations as a given, to bring about some real change to the world. Clearly, Taro wanted to say something with this game. He wanted to present a narrative that tried to break this limitation, not entirely remove it, but at least talk about it within the game that he was making. Dragon Dragoon 3 was released in Japan on December 19th, 2013, and was then released as Drakengard 3 in North America on May 20th, 2014, for the PlayStation 3. A few notes before we get into things. First, I want to talk about how I played Drakengard 3. As I said before, the game was released on the PlayStation 3, and this is the only way that it can be played today. 
I did actually buy Drakengard 3 on the PS3 and was originally going to play it on there, but I quickly realized that I needed a specific switcher to remove the HDCP to actually record footage from the system. Because of this, I decided to just at least try out the emulator version of the game before I got into that. Turns out, it actually works pretty well. I used the RPCS3 PS3 emulator, which I remember trying a few years ago, and most of the games I attempted to run just didn't work at all. So it's really nice to actually see this project coming together and making it possible to run PS3 games on modern hardware. It's just odd to notice that we're at a point where a majority of PS3 games can be played on PC, especially considering how most of those games are just stuck on that console. I will note that I did get some performance issues with the game and some frame drops, but this was not due to the emulator, mostly. This is actually due to Drakengard 3 itself, which had a ton of performance issues on release that were never really fixed. So I apologize if some of the footage looks off because most of it really just was the game itself. The second note I want to make is on the structure of this review. The Drakengard series is known for its multiple endings. Because of this, just like my other videos on this series, we will first talk about the main story of the game, Branch A, and then at the end of the game we will go back to talk about the other branches of the story, which provide different endings. These branches are sort of different from the other games in the series, and this is mostly because of the story itself, but we'll get there. After that, we'll then go back to talk about all of the DLC that was released for the game before moving on to my final thoughts about the project. Drakengard 3 begins, like the other games, with some backstory. Long ago, five goddesses fell upon the land. During this time, there was unending conflict in the world. These goddesses sang songs that restored the world that was once broken. These goddesses were worshipped and called intoners. With their presence, war became a memory. Just as this tale is told, our narrator is killed by our protagonist. We're then told that she is an intoner, one of the ones that we just learned of. She falls upon an army that attacks her below and begins slicing the soldiers to pieces. She then calls upon her dragon, Michael, who also lays waste to the troops. This woman declares war on the other intoners. This woman is who we will play most of the game as, Zero. I would like to note here that this intro is kind of a troll. It stops the narration in the middle by killing the narrator himself, pulling the audience out from a deeper layer in the game to the one that we'll be playing at. There are a lot of these types of tricks in Drakengard 3, and I have to say that they're mostly pretty welcome. I really enjoy when games break the fourth wall or when the developer themselves kind of trolls the audience, attempting to subvert expectations. If you also like that kind of thing, then this is the game for you because it happens quite often. As we begin playing as Zero, we start fighting our way through the fortress. Clearly she's after the intoners, but we're not entirely sure what her real goal is here. I suppose this is as good a time as any to talk about the combat in Drakengard 3. Drakengard 3 is a far cry from any of the previous games in the series. It's either different or upgraded in just about every single way. The combat is not safe from this distinction. The simplest way to describe it is that Drakengard 1 and 2 feel like buttering toast with cold margarine, and Drakengard 3 feels like we're using warm butter. I will say, though, that the combat system is not perfect. Not every single problem has been fixed. But when compared to the previous games, it works like a dream. This is probably just because we're finally working with an actual functioning combat system instead of whatever the first two games were. For starters, a lot of the core mechanics are the same. We're functioning off of a basic action combat system here. We can slash at enemies with our equipped weapon by pressing square and use combos by throwing in some triangles. Using attacks with triangle will deplete our stamina gauge though. The gauge refills pretty quickly, so it's not something that we often have to worry about. But if our gauge is empty, we can't block. Again, we can also block and dodge in this entry, which both work much better than the previous games. We have a health meter and have items that can be used to refill the health gauge when it gets low. We also get access to strength and defense potions, which can be used in battle to deal more damage or take less, respectively. 
The largest change to this game is probably the intoner gauge. This is a small flower bar in the top left corner of the screen that will fill during regular combat. We can activate intoner mode by pressing both sticks in, which grants us invulnerability and increased damage and attack speed. It's basically a super powered mode that we can use to wear bosses down or wipe out crowds of enemies. We also have access to a myriad of weapons in this entry. Instead of having a weapon wheel where we can choose from any that we have equipped, we can now pick from four while in combat. These are one sword, one spear, one pair of gauntlets, and a chakram. Each have their own functions in combat and serve their purpose when needed. The sword is the most basic all-rounder weapon that we start out with. Each weapon will also have a weight, which will determine how fast we can swing it and how large the sweeps of its attacks are. Most swords are generally all function and can be used in most situations. They deal moderate damage, but generally attack faster than other weapons. The spears are mostly slower and attack in a straight line or an overhead arc. These are all, of course, general descriptors because each weapon has its own distinct style, and you can find some that don't fit the category that they're put in. Spears also tend to do a lot more damage in general and were probably my go-to weapon type for the second half of the game. Gauntlets are a much faster weapon type. We sacrifice damage for speed here, but we also get style in return. The gauntlets can be used to fling enemies around in the air, kicking and punching in a fast and massive flurry of blows. The Chakram is probably the weapon I used the least. They're mostly about crowd control, being thrown out in a circle motion. They're great at dealing with crowds, but they also have a special feature that the other weapons don't. They can be used to do ranged attacks on enemies. We can enter a sort of Deadeye mode to slow time and aim at multiple enemies to toss our Chakrams at them. They again don't really do much damage, but have a lot more function than the others. The weapon system in general doesn't have a ton of balance, with a few weapons coming out as the clear winners and the ones that you would want to use over the rest, but there is a large variety. This variety again serves to make the game more enjoyable for a large amount of people. One person can sift through each weapon and decide which playstyle works best for them. Even replaying through the game with a different style can be a totally different experience. In Drakengard 3, there are no ground sections, at least not like there were before. We can't just hop on our dragon whenever we want to. We can summon our dragon during certain combat sequences to assist us in battle, but we can't control him while fighting. I honestly don't mind this change. I think the idea of being able to switch between the two was probably good in the beginning, but clearly the team found that it just wasn't working and wasn't as necessary to the core of the series as they thought, so they scrapped it. I honestly respect these kinds of decisions because they're often the ones that need to be made. Too frequently, games will try to justify keeping a mechanic because it's on brand for the series when the game could just be better without it, and I think that's the case here. Just because that feature is gone doesn't mean that we don't get to ride the dragon, though. We still have aerial sections which see us flying on the dragon, defeating enemies either on ground or in the air. When we're fighting enemies on the ground, we generally have free reign to fly where we want to. We can use the dragon's manual attack or lock on, which hasn't changed from previous entries other than being smoother. We can also use triangle to unleash fire breath, which lets out a consistent stream of flames decimating small enemies in front of us and doing big damage to bosses. When we're fighting enemies in the air, it's mostly on rails. We can move around the screen, but it's more of a kill all the enemies before they fly away type of gameplay. I'm actually also fine with this change because I think it fits the series much more, and if it's between this and janky flight sim mechanics, then I'm all for the new way. We will fight a lot of the bosses in Drakengard 3 on the dragon, but bosses are mostly well designed with good and interesting mechanics, so this isn't usually a problem. Combat overall has just been vastly improved. It's wild what happens when you give an action game series to a developer who has already developed action games. I will say again, it's not perfect. There's definitely some complexity that could be added to the system and some balancing. We could get some larger variety of combos added which could make the fighting system feel even more in depth, but overall it genuinely feels good. It feels fun to play and it's just a great time. 
But you might also notice that as I'm talking about all of this, there is blood splattered across the screen. Every time we kill an enemy on screen, our vision gets covered in their guts. Drakengard 3 is a deliberately gory game. If you remember the quote from Yoko Taro before, this will make a lot more sense. As soon as we boot up the game, we begin automatically killing the enemies in front of us. But why do we do this? Well, because they have a health bar, and we have a sword. This is what we're conditioned to do. The parameters have been set, and when those things are in play, our hands take over. We are no longer making the conscious decision. The body is reacting and putting into motion controls that we aren't physically aware of. But as soon as the blood hits the screen, we almost feel bad. We didn't realize it would be like this. We then become annoyed by the blood on the screen, and I honestly think that says more about us as the player than it does the game itself. Add to the pile that the enemies scream as we kill them. There's tons of enemy dialogue in the game as we trudge through hordes of soldiers, screaming troops begging for their lives, pleading not to be killed. But we do it anyways. Why? Because it gives us experience points, because we might level up a little bit more if we do. This is exactly what Taro wanted us to feel. He wants you to feel uncomfortable. He doesn't want you to be okay with slaughtering the enemies in front of you. He wants you to understand that you are an all-powerful being who can slice through hundreds of grown men with a sword, and he needs you to do that to progress in the game, but he doesn't want you to feel good about it. As we make our way through the castle, we fight our first mini-boss, the Titan. This is an enemy that we'll encounter a lot throughout the experience. The Titan is something not quite human, but something else. They're tall and use a large blade to deliver swooping attacks onto the battlefield. But as is the strategy with a lot of enemies in this game, if we are faster than them, we will succeed. As we're making our way through the fort, we're constantly talking to our dragon, Michael, who is giving us vital information and also helping us in battle. Michael is incredibly powerful with tons of strength and fight prowess to go around. It seems that he and Zero have an established relationship, one that we haven't seen quite yet. After we defeat the Titan, Michael tells Zero to go defeat her sisters while he takes care of the Titans. Michael calls her a fool as she runs off, and this will be important later. It's also important to note here that Zero declares that she will kill anyone in her way, women, children, and even the elderly. She doesn't care, but as the player, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we? As we reach the center of Cathedral City, we meet Zero's sisters. Five, four, three, two, and one. Each of Zero's sisters have their own distinct personality, each different from the last with their own histories and reasons for existing, but we'll get into all that in due time. Now it's time to fight the sisters. We have to fight all of them at once, at least two, three, four, and five. None of them actually die, though. They all escape before we finish them off. After we defeat the sisters, one calls her dragon Gabriel, which is clearly a twisted and demonic version of a dragon. One has done something to her dragon, something to gain more power. We don't have to defeat Gabriel, just do a bit of damage, because when we do, Zero is attacked and loses her arm. She's about to be killed by one, but Michael steps in to save her. The sisters escape before he can kill them, and Gabriel counterattacks. Michael sacrifices himself to save Zero. One declares that killing the intoners is a lost cause on Zero's part. One massive strength that Drakengard 3 has over the previous entry is that it leans closer to the original Drakengard when it comes to storytelling. We are back to the days of efficiency in the game's script. The game is constantly throwing information at us. It's not so much that we're going to get lost in the muck, but it's just enough to keep us interested. The game also assumes that the characters already know the world that they are living in. We don't have characters monologuing to other ones about the history of Midgard. It makes them feel more realistic, like they've actually lived here their whole lives. It's also just a better way to transmit information to the audience. If you wait for every cutscene to deliver a slew of exposition, the user is going to get bored and probably only retain half of it. Drakengard 3 doesn't do this. It drip feeds us new developments across the course of its story, which keeps us on our toes and keeps us wanting more. We then hear a new narrator telling us about the world. She tells us about the world protected by song, divided into five lands, the land of seas, the land of mountains, the land of forests, the land of sands, and the cathedral city, the place we just were. 
Zero's goal is made clear, that she is determined to kill her other five sisters. She's currently in the Land of Seas, healing and regenerating. One year has passed since the events that we just witnessed. Zero is having a nightmare of the events, begging Michael not to leave her. She has since replaced her arm with a mechanical version of the appendage. Even though she could regenerate it, she prefers not to. I should also note here that Zero now has a flower in place of her right eye. This, in story, is supposed to have been present from the beginning of the game. This was not something that happened to her when she was at Cathedral City. When we look at the in-depth lore of Drakengard later, we will notice that Zero had this eye very early on in her story, and it's not a new development. This was an error in continuity and something that Taro stated himself was supposed to be there from the beginning, but that someone higher up thought that should be a character development trait rather than part of her original design. Outside, Mikhail is playing in the mud. Mikhail is actually a reincarnated version of Michael. Dragons have one last wish to spend their life on when they're dying. They can use this wish to reincarnate themselves if they so choose. Mikhail is a far cry from the terrifying beast that was Michael, though. He's very childlike, immature, and doesn't take much seriously. He also doesn't retain any of Michael's memories. He's basically a new child dragon that was born from Michael's death. Mikhail is doing something in the mud. I should also note here that Drakengard 3 really lays into the humor in this entry. This is present much more in the beginning half of the game than it is in the second. There is a point where the tone changes drastically, and the game becomes much darker, and I do think at its core, this is a very dark story, but the beginning sections are pretty joke-heavy. I don't mind this too much, as some of the humor is actually pretty top-tier. There is one scene in the game that actually had me laughing pretty hard. Some of it is a little juvenile and doesn't exactly land, but for the most part, it's pretty good. It also tends to lighten the tone of the game so that we aren't just trudging through the dark and dreary muck for 20 hours or so. We actually get to see these characters interacting as they normally would, making the dark moments that much darker when viewed in comparison. Zero is clearly very strict with Mikhail, screaming at him and sending him running off crying. Mikhail and Zero establish their boundaries pretty quickly. She tells him that she can't call him by his name, Mikhail, until he becomes a full-fledged dragon. Until then, she calls him things like Dummy or Hey You. As she makes her way out of the cabin, Zero spots soldiers off in the distance. She tells Mikhail to deal with the battleship up ahead, and she'll take care of the trash on the ground. It should also be noted here that parts of a brief poem grace the screen as we journey through this intro scene. This is a prophecy that will spell out the events of the game. The game is telling us its end from the beginning, but clearly too vague for us to glean any meaning from it just yet. As we make our way through the scores of soldiers, we also see how Zero treats Mikhail. Their relationship is very rocky. Clearly, Zero doesn't respect him. She looks down on him and thinks that he doesn't have enough experience yet to exactly help her in battle. Mikhail doesn't exactly understand Zero yet, though, either. He has no idea why she wants to kill her sisters, something that Michael was more than willing to help out with. This is a mystery that we also need to solve along the way. This is one of my favorite parts of Drakengard 3, the setup. The game doesn't let us know the motivation of the character that we're playing. On the outside, this motivation looks pretty grim and particularly tragic. We're playing a character who is seeking out her siblings to kill them, but why? We have to then assume that the siblings are each unredeemable characters, that they have done something so wrong that they must be taken care of. We assume that Zero has a reason for doing this, something that we're not aware of yet, but we're willing to go along for the ride. The setup is simple in this way. We know what we have to do, we just don't know why we need to do it yet. It's up to the game to explain this to us. Zero does say that she wants to be the only intoner in the world, that she wants there to be no others, and this is why she's killing her sisters. But as the player, we just assume that there's more than this. Most ground combat levels in Drakengard 3 are laid out in a similar manner. We run through a linear path, defeating enemies and reaching a sealed area. The sealed areas usually see us killing a certain amount of enemies or mini-bosses until we're allowed to leave through the exit door. We usually do this two or three times and the level is finished. Towards the end of this level, we find a weapon shop that is currently unmanned. 
There's a note left by a woman named Accord who says that the owner is away, but they're still conducting business through mail. In between each mission, we're allowed to buy new weapons or items from the shop. We can also upgrade weapons which cost gold and one material. Materials rank from most common to least. Bronze, silver, gold, white, and black. These materials can be found in chests through our ground mission. There are three chests in each ground mission that contains them. These can have anything from weapons to materials or gold. From the menu, we can also change the weapons that we want to equip for the mission, swapping them out for new or better ones. Zero then makes camp at the cove with Mikhail. Mikhail asks why Zero doesn't stand in for the shopkeeper until he gets back, but Zero obviously thinks this is dumb and beneath her. Mikhail wants to rest longer, but Zero is ready to head out, so the group leaves. While killing soldiers, we learn that Zero can exploit her sister's powers once she kills them. We're also learning more about Mikhail. He's clearly set up to be someone who needs to be taken care of, almost a child. He's constantly talking about fish and really hates the fact that the two have to kill people at all. He's averse to any sort of violence and wants to just relax. Down at the beach, we have to fight a Gigas, another giant mini-boss. These things are also pretty simple. The basic strategy is really just to stay close to them and take them down while avoiding attacks. That's honestly how a lot of the boss fights and mini-boss fights go. There is some variation, and listen, I'm not going to complain because the game actually gives us some variety in enemies, so it works. Just then, platforms begin to arise from the water, taking us deeper into the land of seas, and hopefully closer to Five, the first sister we have to track down. Here we also get access to Accords missions. These are basically like the free expeditions from previous games. They are just a little one-off side mission that either require us to defeat a certain amount of enemies or gather loot under a specific time constraint. There are some missions here that will give us tons of gold if we can kill all the enemies quick enough, but it's mostly best to save these for the later game gold grind. Most of the missions are pretty simple, but some of the later ones can be frustrating, especially the ones that constrain you to a specific weapon type. These aren't all really necessary though, as only some of them reward us with weapons. The ones that reward gold or materials can be skipped if you aren't into them. We arrive at the sunken city, where we have to, again, cut through scores of soldiers. Towards the end, we get to ride Mikhail for the first time. Mikhail, of course, hasn't even touched the battleship he was supposed to destroy, because he just didn't really want to. We have to pilot him around and take out the cannons on the ship. Mikhail can also use a special attack in the air, which will cause him to fly straight at an enemy. This is usually used to open enemies up for weak spot attacks. I should also note that when we fly Mikhail, we actually have to manage his height in the air. Pressing the X button will cause him to flap his wings and rise slightly higher. He will slowly lower and fall in the air while in battle. At first I thought this would be really annoying, but it actually turns out to be a neat little feature. It makes us feel like we're less on rails and that we have more control over the outcome of the battle. This can also be used to dodge, giving us additional movement in fights. We eventually locate the shrine that Five is hiding out in and make our way there. Now, I feel the need to point this out before we go any further, but a lot of the themes in Drakengard 3 are pretty... well... Coomer is the best way to describe it, honestly. There's a lot of carnal references, let's say. Five herself is a very active person inside the bedroom, and this is basically her whole character, at least for now. This is how Zero herself describes her, and we'll see more of that as we go. I'm not the biggest fan of the Coomer aspects of this game, and it's probably the humor that I like the least from the whole thing. A lot of it is played for a joke, but the joke seems to be repeated over and over again. I also think it kind of acts as like a pleb filter, because the game is just full of this stuff at the beginning, and it could turn some people off of getting to the more redeeming parts. Five laments the fact that Michael is gone and Mikhail is in his place. Mikhail is a shadow of the strength that Michael had. She's going to make Mikhail a pet after she kills Zero. Five then sings her song and summons an angel to battle us. Fanuel is our first real boss battle of the game. We fight a lot of these real boss battles with Mikhail. This one is very simple overall. We basically dodge all of his attacks and charge at him to open him up to our attacks. We can then shoot a barrage of fireballs at him. His attacks are pretty simple, shooting jets of water at us from underneath. 
There's really not much to it, but we can activate our intoner mode here to power up Mikhail's attack speed and damage for a short period. After Fanuel is destroyed, Zero goes to finish the job on 5. There's quite the funny moment here where the game breaks the fourth wall a bit, but this doesn't kill 5, not quite yet. <laughs> She pulls the sword from her stomach and sings another song. Just then, her disciple, Dito, slices her in half. The game again references itself by blocking out the sound of Dito beating Five's dead body. Dito relishes in the revenge that he's exacted on his intoner. Each of the intoners normally have a disciple. They are like their assistants of sorts. Their sole purpose and duty is to serve the intoner that they are linked with. Dito is clearly linked with five, but once that intoner is dead, the disciple is relieved of their duty and they usually will serve an intoner that is nearby. In this case, Dito pledges himself to Zero, now becoming our companion. Dito was brainwashed by five and was forced to do unspeakable things with the woman. It's clear that the intoners possess a great power over their disciples and exert this power to get them to do their bidding. But with five dead, Dito can't even seem to remember her name. With him in our party now, we have access to spears. We can hot swap to different weapon types in combat by clicking the right trigger and then using the face buttons to choose a weapon. While doing this, we will actually let out another attack, creating some interesting combo opportunities while switching through our arsenal. With Dito in our party, he will now become our disciple. Disciples will follow us into battle and assist in fights. We can have two equipped at a time. Using disciples will also increase their trust, and at a certain point they will give us more weapons because of it. With this, the group heads off to the Land of Mountains. They have to search for a citadel ruled over by four. Zero hears Michael in her dreams once again. She tells him that not all dragons are like him, clearly showing that she's being forced to deal with Mikhail rather than enjoy her time with him. Mikhail doesn't want to go kill four, especially after what he saw when Zero killed five. He doesn't like the violence and doesn't want to continue with it. Zero explains her reasoning to Mikhail, though, with a meat analogy. He wouldn't want to share a pile of meat with other dragons, and Zero doesn't want to share her power with her sisters. Therefore, she has to kill them. In the mountains, we can now use our spear to defeat shield barricade enemies. We can't jump over these guys or hit them normally. We have to use a special attack with our spear to get past them, and only then will they relinquish their defenses. We make our way through the mountain fortresses, which begins to introduce some platforming. I will say that the level design in Drakengard 3 is much better than anything we've seen in this series so far. These feel like actual levels with traversal and hidden items throughout. There's a reason to go exploring, and there's some slight challenge in getting up to the next area. It just works well and feels like an actual game rather than heading from point A to point B. We encounter a Cerberus, a massive three-headed beast that serves as our mini-boss for this level. He will breathe fire at us, use his tail to sweep the battlefield, and viciously bite at zero. With that being said, he's still pretty simple to defeat. If we just stay close to his side and attack him repeatedly, eventually, his heads will be severed, and we will win the day. He does run away before we can take him fully down, though, and we have to trace him throughout the rest of the level. After he dies, Zero's arm is severed by his head. The flower in her eye then fully blooms and she regenerates through it, taking a new form. The group is shocked at the power that Zero exhibits. Mikhail has already scouted out the next shrine that they need to go visit, a massive spread out plaza to the north. We head into this facility introduced to the ogres that dwell there. These are pretty simple enemies, somewhere between the size of a grunt and a mini boss. They're a little faster though, so we have to avoid their attacks and take them out. We're then matched up against another Gigas. Most of the mini bosses that we fight will be repeated throughout the game. I assume this was to save on costs and not have to create a hundred different ones for the game. There are different variants of each mini boss though, like fire versions or cold versions, usually corresponding to the land that we find them in. I could have used a little more variety here, but the new mini boss types are spread out enough that it wasn't too big of an issue. After this, the group attempts to cross a bridge, but Mikhail destroys it before Zero can make it to the other side. Zero then stabs Mikhail on the way down so she doesn't fall. She ends up getting back onto the bridge, and Mikhail calls her mean, pouting, as he flies ahead. We do begin to learn a bit more about Dito here as well, who has shown himself to be incredibly sadistic. We clearly saw that when we met him as he was laughing while killing his intoner, but he always just generally revels in chaos and death. 
Four's song is putting up a barrier, preventing the group from getting too close to her. Mikhail tries to find another route inside the shield. Zero describes Four as a sleazy evil hidden beneath an exterior that makes her seem kind and caring. The group makes it inside the fortress, and we have to contend with soldiers and cannons on the back of Mikhail. Once we take them out, we have to defeat three Gigas that can be easily destroyed by just shooting fireballs and staying in the sky. Mikhail tries to tell Zero that families are important. It seems like family is something that Mikhail values because he doesn't have one, but Zero can't see this situation through his eyes. Four is nowhere to be found, though, so the group has to head to a snow-capped mountain range to look for Four once more. As we head through the snow-covered mountains, we meet a new enemy type who are incredibly annoying, spirits. Spirits actually have pretty low health and don't do much damage, but when they attach themselves to another enemy, they make that enemy very strong and resistant to being stunned. This creates a huge annoyance, and they can be pretty tough to take down. Taking out the spirits before they attach themselves to an enemy is the best option, but it isn't always easy. Zero and Dito are hit by an avalanche while traveling through the mountains. The game gives us a joke ending as Zero is determined to go on, and Dito completely breaks the fourth wall by looking straight at the camera. Once we defeat another Titan, the group finds a tablet. This tells them they need to head to Mount Bernstein of the Vice Norden, which the group decides to call Mount Whatever because the name is too long. This is a man-made fortress located deep in the mountains. We head through the fortress and we get some more platforming sections, which Zero specifically talks about and references the game designers themselves, again breaking the fourth wall. We defeat another Cerberus and a Titan before the group realizes that Four is probably hiding out in the sky. Zero has to get on Mikhail's back and find her sister. We get our first on-rails flying section, having to contend with groups of wyverns that are coming at us. We also learn that Mikhail hates wyverns. He thinks they're low-rent versions of dragons, and they're seemingly the only things that he does want to kill. We eventually find Four's airship in the sky. Four doesn't seem to want to fight, and she begins to sing her song, Impenetrable Shield of Antiquity. Decadus, Four's disciple, then summons an angel, our next boss, Armoros. Armoros is pretty easy as well, considering most of it's on rails. The thing is covered in cannons that are shooting at us. We can destroy these cannons to stop the assault, but the main part that we have to focus on are these crystals located on the four corners of the massive living fortress. We only have a limited time to destroy each of them as we are sucked in by the castle's pull. Afterwards, we have to fire at the exposed core that Armoros lets out, while it shoots out tons of projectiles that are mostly pretty simple to dodge. Zero then boards Four's airship. Decadus tries to stand in front of Four, but something has happened to Zero. She seems to have regressed to a former or younger personality. Four rejoices in this, realizing that she seems to have her sister back, but this is all a trick to reveal the location of her other sisters and get close to Four so she could stab her. She's killed, and Decadus reluctantly joins our cause. We then realize that Mikhail has taken on a new form, growing slightly stronger than he was before. As his form is upgraded, Zero's sword also levels up. We now have to head to the land of the forests to look for three, but we luckily have a massive airship to do most of our flying. The treasure room seems to be locked, and we haven't found the key yet. Before we can find it though, the airship is shot down, and we land in the forest below. Zero ends up taking revenge on the soldiers that took her brand new airship down. She eventually finds some fairies who are just as rude than when we saw them in Drakengard. Mikhail is lost at this point, and we have to go find him. The fairies tell us that he's in the land, just up ahead, but Zero kills them immediately after getting this information. The fairies continue to taunt as we move through their land and find Mikhail tied in some vines, which we cut down. He was, of course, scared in this situation, but characteristically, Zero doesn't care. We end up meeting the Fairy King. He tells Zero that Three is in the Forest Shrine. He doesn't tell us exactly where it is, because he's smart enough to realize that Zero would kill him if he gave her the information. Zero ends up killing him anyways, and Mikhail freaks out. With a good lead, the group has to wander the forests to locate Three. We end up defeating two Cerberus monsters at once, which can be a little difficult because we can't just use our strategy from before. We have to do a little more dodging here to make things work. I will say that Drakengard 3 is pretty easy overall. It really never gets that difficult. The challenge isn't that high, and as long as we have some healing potions, we can usually survive the situations put in front of us. 
I only died a couple of times throughout the course of the game. There's always a pretty easy way to cheese most of the fights with a spear, which, I'll be honest, I did start doing towards the end of the game because it was honestly faster than really anything else. Once we make it through the forest, we end up meeting Three's disciple, Okta. He's actually not here to attack us, he's here to join our side, and this results in one of the funniest scenes in the entire game. If you only knew the surprise I've got in store for you! I surrender. You what? I surrender. I came here because I want to join your cause. Well spoken, my winged friend. With this, we get Okta on our side as a disciple, and we now have access to Chakram weapons that he uses. These are our one ranged weapon, which can actually be used to take down enemies from far away. It is pretty situational though, as it really doesn't do a ton of damage. It's really only useful when we encounter an enemy that we just can't reach normally. Okta tells us that he left three because his drive for booty, as he calls it, was so strong that three couldn't satiate his needs. Again, pretty Coomer. We end up using the Chakram across the next level to solve the puzzle boxes that Three has created. These are actually enemies that will shoot out balls of energy at us, but we have to hit them with the Chakram when they are opened to solve the puzzle. We find out the shrine is off in the distance, past the lost forest, and Mikhail takes a poop on the side of the road. The Lost Forest is a particularly foggy level, one that we just can't navigate with the minimap alone. We have to follow certain statues that will guide us. These statues are only activated once we defeat the undead around them, which require us to kill them after the bones have split apart. Once the statue is activated, they will point us in the general direction that we need to travel, eventually arriving at another statue. Rinse and repeat until we've left the forest. We then arrive at the shrine to find that Mikhail is once again trapped in vines. We have to rush to the top to save him. Once we do this, Three arrives, wielding her scissor blades. She realizes that Okta has abandoned her. We then see some sort of brainwashed soldiers wandering towards us. We have to hop on Mikhail and dispense with a whopping 99 of them. Three then uses her influence to control Okta. As he doesn't have a choice, he inadvertently summons an angel, quickened puppets of antiquity. Armisail arrives, which takes the form of an army of puppets. One of the best things about Drakengard 3 that it has over the other games is its environment design. We get a lot more color in these games, way more vibrancy. This world feels a lot more alive than the other two. It makes for an incredibly interesting place to spend time in, to fight in, to see scenes in. Especially this boss battle makes us realize that stark contrast to the bland and uninventive environments of the first two. Introducing new spaces and a change in scenery also tends to give the game more identity, letting it become its own thing rather than just another drab medieval world. The boss fight with Armisail is pretty simple. We have to defeat 50 of the walking creepy dolls, which will attach themselves to Mikhail. We can shake them off by dodging, which makes this thing kind of a walk in the park. We then have to fight one larger doll. This one will shoot a beam at us and we have to dodge it. Afterwards, we then have to dash at it a couple times to open it up for damage. Once we do this a few times, the boss goes down. Three then gets crushed by the boss's head, but it doesn't quite kill her. Mikhail then eats three, shocking everyone. This is clearly very much against his nature. This whole time he has detested violence, hated killing people, and advocated for this crusade that Zero has led to stop. But just then, someone named Scent arrives. 
He's Tu's disciple, and he's captured Mikhail. Scent is very cocky and brash. He takes Mikhail back to Tu. He's gone from our party. Now we not only have to find and kill Tu, but rescue Mikhail as well. We have to head to the Land of Sands. The new main enemy type that we're introduced to here are the wolves. These travel in pack with a larger alpha wolf leading them. They can be kind of annoying because they like to jump attack at us and can be pretty quick, so tracking them down to get hits on them can be tough. We then find Mikhail, who's trapped by a golem. The golem is a pretty simple mini-boss. He will shoot projectiles at us in the air and slam his fists into the ground. We can safely defeat him by locking onto him and circling around while avoiding his fist attacks. Scent then arrives and admits defeat, letting them take the dragon, but warning them that he is far more powerful than he can deal with. Before he leaves, though, he tells Zero that the dragon will be her downfall. With Mikhail back, he tells us that Two is located in the Shrine of Sands. In this new temple, we're introduced to wizards, who really just shoot projectiles at us and teleport around annoyingly. We contend with some golems and jumping puzzles before Zero wipes out a few ogres. Her arm is then sliced off and begins to regenerate. She doesn't feel pain in the arm anymore, and she feels like she's becoming more human by the day. Documents inside the base point to the Shrine of Sands. Before we can locate it, though, we have to navigate the desert. Here, when we stand in the sun, we take damage. This damage can luckily be recovered when we stand in the shadows, but if we get hit, then all the health we lost from the sun is gone. We have to travel to three separate temples in the area, defeating the enemies within. These are mostly wizards who have a similar mechanic. If we stand too close to their spell, we take damage. Prioritizing the wizards and stopping their spell makes these fights a lot easier. Eventually, we come across a flame centaur, who works like other centaurs, but his flames damage us. It's the same mechanic as the rest. Standing close will damage us, and we can recover by stepping away. He's not that difficult, though, so putting damage on him fast will take him down easy. We then have access to the shrine and have to take out soldiers with Mikhail. These are basically just fodder that we have to blast through. Inside, we find Two, who seems to be in a catatonic state from her song. She can't handle the power of it, and it's wiped her mind. Zero wants to put her out of her misery. She doesn't feel like Two should have to exist in this state, and she also just wants to kill her. Scent then summons two angels, the ones we saw from before, Egregori and Egregori. This is a pretty annoying boss battle, but not because it's difficult. I'm not sure if I was doing it wrong, but it just took me forever. We have to repeatedly slam into the bosses to take their armor off. Once it's off, we can then damage them, but they regenerate their armor. We have to do this over and over until the enemies are dead. It just took quite a while and was a bit tedious by the end of it. The enemies explode, and Mikhail protects Zero from the blast, getting them out safely. His prowess and strength shocks Zero. She's surprised at how much he's grown. Mikhail kills Two, who calls him Michael right before she dies. Scent then decides to serve Zero. He doesn't care whose side he's on, he just wants to serve an intoner. With that, one is the only sister left remaining. Mikhail once again raises concerns about the deaths that they've caused in their crusade. This time, though, it's a lot more chilling than him just not wanting to. Mikhail is actively traumatized from being forced to kill. This is an incredibly tragic moment and gives us perspective on what we've done. Zero seems to have morality, but this cause blinds her from all that. This crusade cannot end, and it doesn't matter who it hurts or kills. She has to finish it. There's just one sister left, huh, Zero? Finally down to one. So I guess you're gonna kill her now, huh? You got a problem with that? It's just that we've killed a lot of people now, you know? And? Well, when I try to sleep, sometimes I... I can still hear them screaming. Do you, Zero? Do you hear them scream? No, I don't. Wow, Zero. You sure are strong. Mikhail's innocence is the perfect way to show the battered and dark end of this, to show that this corruption has wrecked him and turned him into something that he never wanted to be. He just wanted to be a good dragon. But this is what being a good dragon really is. Our last location is the Cathedral City, the place where this whole game started. The group decides to head in from the air. Here we have another on-rails section and are quickly met with a boss fight against Gabriel, the one responsible for Michael's death one's demonic dragon. One reveals that she doesn't have a disciple, she has no need for one. 
We have to defeat Gabriel by shooting at his mouth. We can really only do this when he's attacking. Gabriel is winning the fight, so Mikhail and Zero run, but the city is falling down around them. We then have to make our way through the city, retracing the steps that we took at the beginning of the game. After we defeat a Titan and some Lancers, Mikhail and Zero are split up at a falling bridge. When we arrive at the Cathedral Tower, the place where we fought the sisters the first time, there's a Cerberus to greet us. When we defeat it, Zero tells her disciples that she needs to go alone. She doesn't need them. She tells them that they can't remain human without an intoner. She gives them their old forms back, and they appear as white doves before her. She tells them goodbye as they fly off. Heading inside, we have to make our way to the top of the tower, defeating all of the soldiers that stand in our way. Once we arrive at the top, one sits on a throne awaiting Zero. She's reading something, a record of life in Cathedral City. Cathedral City was the origin of magic, yet their civilization has no knowledge of the creation of these magics. One is looking for the purpose of the intoners. One then summons Gabriel, who attacks Mikhail. The dragon remarks that Gabriel is incredibly strong, but the two team up, ready to take him down. This was probably the first actually difficult fight in the game. I did die here a couple times. Eventually you get the rhythm, but it was nice to feel some challenge. Gabriel's attacks all have to be avoided until he charges up his fire attack. We can then shoot fireballs at him to knock him down. After this, we can damage him. We have to do this over and over. While fighting, Mikhail says that he feels bad for Gabriel. He doesn't want to have to fight him and doesn't want to be doing any of this. After we defeat Gabriel, Mikhail is hit by one of his blasts. He lets out a burst of energy and Mikhail is gravely injured. Zero tells him to reincarnate so that he can come back again. He'll be able to use his final wish to come back. Mikhail doesn't want to do this, though. He uses his life to try and kill Gabriel, to save Zero. He wants nothing more than to help, to be strong and powerful. Zero, finally showing emotion for Mikhail, begs him to stop. She truly doesn't want him to be gone. She wants him to live under any circumstances. Mikhail doesn't care. Even if he regenerates, he'll lose his memory again and he won't be the same person. He'll be different. In the end, Zero uses Mikhail's name, showing that he's finally become a full-fledged dragon. This moment is so incredibly sad. It's tragic, it's bleak, but it's also a fitting end for these two characters. To see Zero finally realize that she does care for Mikhail, and for Mikhail to realize his own potential and save Zero like he always wanted. It's great to finally see that we're back to the levels of Yoko Taro's story writing that we saw in the first game. With that, Gabriel is weakened and we have to finish him off. This isn't too hard, slashing at his weak spot will send him falling down. We can then wail on him over and over until he's destroyed. After this, One says her goodbyes to Gabriel as he fades. Zero approaches her sister and brings her sword down on her. Completing her mission, she has killed her final sister. She tells Mikhail it's over, but his dead body doesn't respond. She's then stabbed in the chest, but not by One. Well, sort of. This is One's brother. He was created from One, just like Zero created her sisters. The sword he carries was made from a dragon's fang, which can kill an intoner. One's brother was created to kill Zero in case One was bested, but it doesn't matter. Zero never intended to live through this. She reaches out towards Michael. One's brother is then left without any intoners, doomed to live in a world without them. The game ends, but after the credits we see one's brother leaving the cathedral. With no intoners left, he aims to form a new religion, taking on one's name, cackling and laughing. We then see white doves fall upon Mikhail and Zero's bodies. A woman approaches, saying that this branch's ending should have been known. She says that they should have taken a different branch somewhere along the way. A lot of this doesn't make too much sense as it stands, but trust me, we'll get there. First, I just want to say I love the main story of Drakengard. We're not really even done yet, as there's a lot more to get to as we journey into the other branches, but I consider the first branch the main tale. It's a fantastic story and sets up a fresh, vibrant, and interesting world. It brings back the tragic, bleak, and unyielding nature of the world that Yoko Taro created. Its characters are all incredibly interesting, even if they are a bit wacky and odd. They all feel distinct and unique. They have their own roles to play in this world. The story is also just full of so much emotion. It builds up to a perfect finale that wraps everything up. Every character is given ample time for us to get to know them throughout the tale, and there's just so much depth and mystery here. 
so many little threads for us to go off of and look into. A world with so much depth and lore that we can only help but wonder what came before. With Branch A completed, we should probably talk about the other branches to the story. So like I said before, Drakengard 3 does retain its alternate ending structure from the other games in the series, but unlike those games, there's actually an in-world reason that these endings exist. Instead of endings, we get branches. These are other paths that the story could have taken. They will be explained further as we journey through these branches, but for now, all we know is that this mystery woman is venturing into these other branches and observing them to see if things could have turned out differently. Branch B begins with this mystery woman explaining that when a unique set of conditions are met in time, called singularities, splits occur. On April 1st, 1000 AD, one of these splits occurs. This is where Branch B begins. This takes place around when we met Okta in the original branch, but here an anomaly occurred. The forest that the group was supposed to travel through actually took a different form. We start at camp and talk to Scent, who seems to have no recollection of two, his intoner. We fight through the forests, defeating some necromancers, and eventually coming across Armasail again. Things are slightly different this time around. We have to defeat the Horde, which is pretty simple because they're very weak. They begin rolling heads around and three arrives. She says that something is wrong with the forest, but Zero can't hear the crying that her sister speaks of. One holds the secret, deeper inside the forest. The dolls begin to break apart and three disappears. We once again head deeper into the forest. This time, Zero is ambushed and attacked. She's absolutely brutalized, but she once again begins to regenerate from the flower. We defeat these titans with Mikhail. The mystery narrator then goes on to jot some notes on the timeline. This time around, the forest is more violent and it has changed. The other big change to this branch is that Two and Scent are independent. They don't exist normally as intoner and disciple. We then have to defeat multiple statues of three in the forest. We eventually find her, but before she can attack, she collapses. She invited one to the forest to try and kill her, but it didn't work out. She dies without us having to do anything. One is clearly up to something in the forest, and this timeline is obviously off, and Zero realizes it. We find two dancing in the forest, and Dito attacks her, but Scent gets to him before he can land a blow. It seems that his true nature has come back to him. Dito is killed by the betrayer. He pledges himself to two once again, and we have to fight the both of them. This fight is pretty simple because we only have to take one of them down. The tricky thing that two will do is mimic our moves, especially if we use intoner mode. She will also activate it. Being fast and dealing a lot of damage, though, takes her down. Decadus then stabs two. As Scent tries to rush at her, he kills Okta, and Zero stabs Scent. The two crawl on the ground towards each other, finally able to be together. As they touch hands, a beam of light shines down. This magic allows them to combine and create an angel called Raphael. We have to defeat him. He's pretty simple, but we have to defeat him in a certain time frame, five minutes. The goal here is pretty similar to the other large boss battles in the game. We have to dash attack to open a weak spot and do damage when the enemy is stunned. Once he's dead, the poison is about to take over the forest. Mikhail is once again weakened, gravely wounded from the battle. This time, Mikhail says that he's done. He just can't take it anymore. Sorry, Zero, but I think I'm done. I'm really sorry, Zero. <laughs> Don't you die on me, you asshole! Don't you... Don't you dare leave me alone again! This ending is just as tragic as the previous one. Hearing Mikhail apologize to Zero for dying is just heartbreaking. Zero weeps over his body and begs Mikhail not to leave here. She laments the flower that sprouted from her eye, but then she has a realization. She uses her song to forge a pact, to bring Mikhail back. She's glad that she met Mikhail. Her song does bring Mikhail back, but Zero is nowhere to be found. The flower that was present in her eye is now a part of Mikhail. The two are able to be together as one. 
I don't mind this ending. It isn't my favorite, but it isn't bad either. I do think it tugs on the heartstrings a bit, but it isn't as fitting as the other ones. We see a small cutscene after the credits, summarizing what we saw. The narrator says that Zero created an entirely new concept known as a pact, one that we're very familiar with if we've played the previous Drakengard games. With this, we unlock another divergence, Branch C. This takes place after two had captured Mikhail. The anomaly here is that two enacted some type of influence over Mikhail. Zero was the only one to do this previously, so it doesn't make sense that it's happening in this timeline. Here we have to cross the desert once more, heading to the three temples and staying in the shadows. This time we're avoiding the cold rather than the heat. Once we reach the end, Mikhail seems to be in pain from some type of spell. He seems to have devolved to one of his previous forms. At camp, Mikhail tells Zero that he wants to be better and stronger. She tells him to stay back and rest because whatever happened to him could be dangerous. We head through the ruins and temples just as we did before. Mikhail is with us at this point. The mystery woman is observing the events and thinks that this branch could be very important. She then tells us that this branch has significant anomalies. Both Mikhail and the group are experiencing anomalous behavior that's worth studying. We then arrive in Cathedral City. We seek out Two, who has placed the curse on Mikhail. She seems to be under some sort of control, wanting to kill Zero. We have to fight her, and it's pretty similar to the last time we did. She's a little stronger now, though. It was at this point that I started cheesing the game by using the spear attack. Certain spears can attack downwards and do a ton of damage. Dodging out of these attacks mostly keeps you from being harmed. Doing this over and over again lets you beat most foes unpunished. After Two is defeated, she approaches Scent, a smile on her face, only to be stabbed by Dido's spear. Everyone in the group attacks her, but she won't die. Then Scent finishes her off. Something is summoned at this point, but Zero recognizes the trap. The entire group is destroyed, only Zero and Mikhail surviving. The two make their way out and eventually find one underground. She thinks intoners are a scourge on human life. She realizes that Zero is trying to kill her sisters because intoners will bring an end to the world. She intends to take them out and then take her own life to keep the world from ruin. The thing is though, an intoner has to be killed by a dragon, so she intends to use Mikhail for this purpose, something he hasn't realized yet. This is kind of the full reveal of Zero's plan this whole time. It turns out she did have good intentions in the end. We haven't fully realized the details of all of this, but her killing was for a reason. The question the audience member has to ask themselves is, was the killing worth it? Or alternatively, does it matter? These are the questions Taro himself presents us with, the creator asking the player. One agrees with Zero's conquest. She thinks the world has no place for the intoners, but she also knows about Zero's flower and thinks that it will destroy the world before she can be killed. The two sisters are determined to kill each other, and one doesn't think that Zero can take care of herself, so she wants to do it for her. We have to fight Abdiel here. These are golems that will do big damage to us if we are hit. The goal here is to dash attack the golems and reveal the core underneath one of them. The core changes each time the golems are put back together, but we have to locate it to be able to do damage to the boss. Once we defeat Abdiel, one summons Gabriel again. Mikhail attacks him and takes out Gabriel, but he was also killed in the process, viciously cut in half. This is an incredibly brutal ending for him. We now have to fight one, who's pretty simple overall. She does some damage, but we can avoid her attacks pretty easily. Zero takes her out, finishing off the final sister, but this leaves Zero alive. She can't take her own life because Mikhail is gone. She needs a dragon powerful enough to kill her, but she doesn't have one anymore. This leaves her quest unfinished, and the world is left to ruin. This is probably one of the more sad endings. It's heartbreaking to see Mikhail's lifeless corpse laying there as Zero limps away, defeated and emotionally broken. It's incredibly brutal and just gut-wrenching to watch play out. This ending does not relent, it just keeps punishing the viewer, forcing them to feel. It's beautiful. Zero heads off to find a dragon. With Branch C completed, we only have one left, but beating Branch C doesn't automatically unlock the final branch. There are some requirements that we have to finish first. We have to collect every weapon in the game first, which really isn't that hard of a task to complete, especially if we've been gathering all of the chests along the way. 
The game doesn't make it hard to revisit chapters and go back to previous levels, so it doesn't take that much time. We also have to finish the Accord missions that do reward us with weapons, get the weapons from our disciples after using them in battle enough, and buy the weapons in the store. Again, none of this is incredibly time consuming and doesn't take much extra effort if we were already collecting them along the way. To unlock Branch D, we also have to play through the Lost Verses. These are unlocked after completing Branch C. The Lost Verses begin when the narrator realizes that she lost some verses somewhere along the way. The first verse actually takes place in Branch A at the end of Chapter 4 after 2 has been killed. Zero needs to return to her cottage to get something. When we arrive at the cottage, Zero goes in by herself. She's become aware of Accord, the narrator and observer of this story. She's looking for some sort of clue that could lead her to a world where the flower never appeared. Then Accord herself arrives. This is who has been tracking us the entire time and studying the events of the timelines. She tells Zero that no matter the branch, it seems to always end in disaster. Zero thinks that Accord is making the future, some type of god controlling these events, but she denies this theory. The second lost verse occurs during Branch B. When the group was looking for three, they decided to head back into the mountains. The group tries to find some treasures in the chests nearby, but only find junk. They then take shelter in the mountainside. Zero decides to get some sleep, but she ends up meeting Accord again. She once again warns her that she needs to change course, otherwise this branch will end in disaster. Zero tries to get the book from her, but she dodges every attempt. Zero almost gets it, but Accord does something weird that I'm just not even going to talk about. Accord is technically not allowed to interfere with the world. She is a recorder, and it's her job to record the distant past and future. She was sent by people from the old world, the place before. Accord has been tempted to help, though, because of the bad timelines that Zero has been encountering. The final Lost Verse takes place during the middle of Branch C. Zero once again meets Accord, who tells her that Zero is running herself into the ground. She can't brute force her way through this. She wants Zero to let the recorders handle the intoners. Zero says she'll kill Accord if she gets in her way. If Zero can't find a way to rectify these timelines, then Accord will be forced to neutralize her. We have to destroy three towers in the desert by taking out the wizards controlling them. Mikhail realizes that with this ending, they can go back and see everyone, but Zero doesn't want to do this. With this, the last of the lost verses has been found. Branch D has been unlocked, the final record of Zero. This branch begins during verse 3. The party is all here, but the group has one final shot to see if this ending will work out for them. Here, at camp, Zero reveals to Mikhail that dragons were meant to kill intoners. They naturally have a craving to eat them. Zero is okay with this because, as we know, she needs Mikhail to kill her once this is all over. We then assault Cathedral City, fighting through the forces ahead of us. We find Four inside, who summons a demon dragon, which she shouldn't be able to do naturally. One is the only one that could do this. This Battle is pretty easy and very similar to the Gabriel fights from before. We stun the dragon when it attacks and damage it when it's down. We don't get many opportunities to do it though, so this fight can just take a while. With Zophiel defeated, we have to take on Four herself. She's quick and powerful, especially when she charges up attacks, but she's no match for Zero. She kills Four and Mikhail finishes the job, eating her. This causes Mikhail to evolve twice in one evolution. This is clearly another anomaly, not normal for this world. We then meet Accord again, who explains Mikhail's hunger for intoners. Apparently some dragons can control it, which is why Mikhail resists eating Zero. Accord can't tell the group where the cravings for intoners comes from. Accord asks Zero if she's afraid of losing her friends, but Zero says she doesn't have any. Accord only offers a warning that the branch they're in is damaged and the group will grow chaotic as they venture forth, but this means a greater chance of saving the world. We journey through the forests once again, defeating the now chaotically warped monsters. There we find Five. She should be dead, but somehow resurrected herself. She summons beasts to her side. Dito loves this, enjoying the chaos of this world. He decides to switch sides and rejoin his former intoner. He summons Fanuel, another angel for us to fight, but Sent summons Egregori, and the two do battle in the background while we fight Galgaliel. We have to defeat 99 of them, and once this is complete, 5 is open to be damaged. We then have to defeat more of the roaming beasts and finish off 5. 
Zero slices her up while Dido and Scent watch their summons battle. The two both start to disappear. Zero realizes that they summoned angels without an intoner to aid them. This is a price they have to pay, causing them to disappear. Scent realizes his mistake, but he doesn't want to live in a world without two, and he accepts his death. At this point, Accord started to find that she was feeling strange emotions, unbeknownst to us. Okta seems to think that Mikhail won't be able to restrain his appetite. The group starts their search for the final sisters, and we have an on-rails section in the sky, while Mikhail sings an original song for quite a while. Stinky dragon, nor am I a dirty dragon. Hop on my back and let's go for a ride. We have to fight some wyverns and gargoyle cubes. We face off against another summon brought upon by three. This is called Ezrael. He will shoot massive amounts of projectiles our way. Our goal is to dodge these attacks and shoot at him while he's open. He goes down pretty easy. Decadus then decides to sacrifice himself, at least in this form, by summoning his angel and defeating Ezrael. We finish him off and Zero takes down three. Only one is left now. Zero decides that it's finally time to tell Okta about the flower in her eye. We have sort of a flashback to two years ago. We fight enemies while Zero narrates her backstory. She saw the flower on the day she died. The flower has kept her alive this whole time. She's really just a walking corpse. It threatens the world, though. While it exists inside Zero, it grows and feeds off of her. Zero tried to take her own life when she realized what the flower was going to do, but it didn't work. Ripping the flower out made things worse. The flower sprouted five children, girls, her sisters. The flower had a defense mechanism to create copies of Zero so that she couldn't end her own life. Each of the sisters ran off with a piece of Zero's magic. Her sisters then started fighting for peace, which she thought was ridiculous because they were born from a flower that would end the world. Michael is in this flashback. Zero found Michael because she needed a way to kill her sisters. This is when she met Michael, the strongest dragon of all. We hear Michael asking Zero if she's sure about killing her sisters. We then see Zero arrive at Accord's shop. She's ready to hear her out. She wants to talk about her sisters and how much time she's got left. This is the big reveal of the game, Zero's origin and why she's doing this. The whole time she's really been trying to save the world, she's fighting her sisters because she knows that if she doesn't, everything will be wiped out. This is where the fervor comes from, the determination, the hatred. Accord says that she will never forget this journey, no matter what happens at the end of this branch. Zero and Mikhail fly into Cathedral City with Gabriel on their tail. Zero tells Mikhail to fight Gabriel while she runs into the city. We have to fight across a long bridge full of pretty difficult enemies. It's not an easy battle, but we can make it through by taking it slow and picking our moments. At the end of the bridge, Gabriel and Mikhail come tumbling to the ground, and one is ready to fight. Our final battle is against her. She's actually pretty easy, and Zero's sword will do more damage to her here, making it pretty simple if we have it equipped. We then hear silence and accord talking. She says if the flower isn't destroyed, this will bring an end to humanity. Some people in the old world think that this branch should be erased, but accord doesn't agree. She then questions herself, saying that she should erase this entry, hand off the recording. She then adds the recording. Okta then comes in at the last second, as one is about to defeat Zero. He sacrifices himself as well to weaken one, giving Zero an opportunity to take her down. Then Accord shows up, interfering in battle and breaking her protocol. One just won't die though, and Accord calls in some sort of strike. This will cause the shield to vanish for half a second. Zero uses this moment to take her shot and kill both Accord and one. Zero limps away from the fight. Accord is still alive, barely hanging on. She says that she didn't see this coming, but it was more human than she expected. It's also revealed that she's actually some sort of mechanical android. Accord begs for her death. She's tired. Zero gives her this piece. With that, we have one more verse, one final level to play. Zero tells Mikhail this is it. Once the flower goes into full bloom, Mikhail needs to destroy it. Before she goes, she needs to tell him one more thing. There's one more thing. I need to tell you. What? You've grown strong, Mikhail. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero, you big. 
And then the shit begins. If you've heard of Drakengard 3, then you've probably heard about the final boss. If this is the case, then I can confidently say it's everything you've heard and more. This final fight is actually a rhythm game, just like in Drakengard's final ending, and not unlike the original ending E that Taro had envisioned for the game. Here we fly around the flower with a statue of Zero in the center. The statue will start to emit rings that will kill us if we are touched by them. We have to pull our shield and defend ourselves against them. We have to time it though, bringing in the rhythm game that we are talking about before. Now this doesn't sound too bad, and even the first Drakengard ending E wasn't very hard, but there's a lot of things that make this final fight incredibly frustrating. First, the fight is incredibly long. There are technically seven phases to the fight, one for each sister and then one where the sisters all work together. Each section lasts such a long time, and top it off with the fact that we can't skip any of these cutscenes, this makes for an eight minute fight every single time we want to try it. So the length is frustrating, but it's also the, just the fight itself. Zero sections, the first phase, is incredibly easy, especially when we get used to the timing. The rings come out normally and there's no issue here, but every phase is different, and we quickly realize that this whole thing is just the game trolling us as hard as it can. Five phases move the camera while the rings are coming out, causing us to not be able to see where Mikhail is or the rings themselves. Four's phase sends the notes out closer together while moving the camera up and down, making it harder to have perspective and see where the notes are in relation to Mikhail. Three's phase zooms the camera on her face so we can't even see Mikhail and we have to work completely blind, only going off sound. Two's phase closes in on Mikhail so that we can't see where the notes are coming out. One just sends a ton of notes at us while the camera goes crazy and we have no idea where anything is. Then the last phase combines everything into one section. The whole thing is just insane, incredibly frustrating, and hard to get to. Top this all off with the fact that when the final cutscene starts, there's still one note left that we can't see, and we have to hit it without seeing anything to keep the cutscene going. The whole thing is just incredibly unfair, difficult, and cheap. It's incredibly frustrating, and I'll be honest, I gave up after about two hours. I got to one's phase multiple times, but this fight honestly just broke me. Fuck! 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 Oh. Fuck me, bro. Fuck! 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 But to be honest, that's not the whole story, because this fight is incredibly fitting for this entry. It ends the game perfectly and is a fantastic finale. The character design of the boss is fantastic, bringing us back to the original Drakengard, evoking images of the queen. The symbolism is quite clear. The sisters have all returned to the flower and become pawns of it, each blooming from its petals and doing its bidding. The petals represent one of the number of sisters, and zero exists in the center as the plant's origin. The entire game ends in song, the chimes of the songs sung by the intoners. The grey statue goddesses hover over the world, fighting a battle not of swords and blood, but of notes. The choral music that backs the entire thing is also perfect, giving the whole fight a biblical feel. It's almost religious in spirit and theme. The whole thing is wonderful. On one hand, I love this fight and everything it represents artistically and creatively, but on the other hand, I hate this fight when I actually have to play it. After the fight ends, we hear Mikhail talking to Zero, in a final scene that brings emotion out of me only like Mary's letter at the end of Silent Hill 2 could. Hey, Zero? Yeah? I... I had a lot of fun. With you, I mean. It was fun being with you. The killing was hard. It was really hard. But... Stop repeating things. But getting to be with you, Zero? Getting to eat next to you? Getting to fly around with you? Getting to have you yell at me? And then getting to be friends again? It was really, really fun. I'm glad. Mikhail. Yeah? It's... 
Almost time. Okay. This short scene just makes it all worth it. The whole arduous and tortuous endeavor is made all right because this is what lies after. Before we talk about the DLC, we should probably talk about the music of Drakengard 3. Composed by Kaichi Okabe, the soundtrack is just wonderful and is a huge step up for the series in terms of music. The whole thing is wonderfully crafted and you can tell that time and effort was put into the music and making sure that it fit with the game. The Forgotten is a beautiful track with choral voices bleeding through. It gives us a grand vision of the world, a wholly forgotten one beneath the one that we see today. Ray of the Brave Battlefield rings through with a massive scope. It feels grandiose, and we envision a wild battlefield beneath us, hundreds of soldiers ahead. The flutes and instruments all come together to create a clear and perfect vision. Leaf of Chaos rolls in with scattered keys, the piano glittering over the track. The angelic voice pops through the song, giving this a another biblical quality, fitting with the game's theme and structure. The whole soundtrack is incredibly good, offering a new vision for the series, something we haven't seen from it before. But before we can talk about my final thoughts on the game, we need to talk about the DLC, to visit each of these characters individually. There was a lot of DLC released for Drakengard 3. A lot of this was cosmetic, allowing us to change our outfits for characters or even change the background music. We could dress up like Kaim or use his sword in battle. But what's more interesting is the story DLC that was released for the game. Each of these packs allow you to play as one of the different sisters from the game and gives us a bit of backstory. Five's DLC sees her traveling with Dido before the events of the game to try and find some delicious food that she can eat. Each of the sisters are a representation of what Zero has lost. They are a part of her personality that has been split from her. Because of the incident with the flower, the sisters that were born from it are really just parts of her. Five represents Zero's lust, greed, and confidence. Five clearly has cravings for everything. She lives to fulfill her desires and wants whatever she can think of exactly when she thinks of it. She can't wait and can't enjoy the things she already has. This eventually sees us taking down a massive crab to try and satiate her needs. Thor's DLC sees her trying to protect the world from evil. Thor is very much a graceful and refined person. She's almost the opposite of Five. She doesn't debase herself or lower herself to a carnal level. This is clearly the part of Zero when she was a child, before she was corrupted and held on to her pride. Thor ends up encountering a band of pirates in the air and slaughters them as they beg for their lives. And this clearly furthers the theme of the game and the idea that violence is something more than just numbers on a screen. Three is more wild. She is lethargic and paranoid. She obsesses about anything she finds herself fixated on. This is the part of Zero that was relentless when she was younger and poor, killing only to get food and be able to survive in the world. Three's DLC has a heavy presence of her disciple Okta, seeing her fall down deeper into the macabre parts of her own personality. Two is a brighter, more colorful soul. She expresses herself and is very considerate of the people around her. This reflects an alternate version of what Zero could have been had things gone different. This is sort of the good ending version of Zero that never really was. Two's DLC is very dark, eventually seeing her fighting a homunculus and falling deep into despair after seeing the horrors of battle. Her and Scent are forever scarred by what they experienced. 
One is the most logical character. She values her intelligence, and it's the largest part of her character. Now she is also very dour and doesn't seem to smile or find joy in anything. This is the representation of Zero before she died. She was unsatisfied with the world and angry at the chaos, searching for logic and reason where she could find none. Her DLC mostly focuses on the relationship between her and her brother, seeing that she doesn't have a disciple. The final DLC, the one based around Zero, sees us playing her in various flashbacks. It seeks to further flesh out the relationship between her and Michael, and exactly how the two came together. We realize that she is telling this story to multiple accords in her cottage. This was the original warning, telling Zero that she needed to destroy the flower. We also get to see Zero talk about Michael and what she enjoyed about him so much. These DLC all further the world of Drakengard 3, attempting to flesh out the characters further and explain the backstory of the world as well as the people in it. Most of these are very short and don't have any large bearing on the larger plot overall. A lot of them feel unnecessary, even though they're fleshing out the characters that we see in the main game. Just because they're so short means that we don't get another big grand tale, it's just tinier adventures. Drakengard 3 is incredibly impressive. It's a feat of storytelling, weaving a narrative that wraps all the characters into one interesting and unique tale. The world that it tells this story in is so chock full of lore and depth that we're always searching for more information on what's around us. The story starts out as a goofy and wacky fantasy in a strange land that seems incredibly foreign to us. But when the real feelings start to come and the story becomes this bleak and dark epic, those quirky upstarts seem incredibly far away. We're left wondering how we got here and how things could end so tragically. But this was something we knew from the start. We knew that tragedy was baked into this tale. No one was coming out unscathed. Even the so-called good ending is terribly sad. But still, the complexity of this game and how it interacts with itself is amazing. The theme of violence and war, revenge and hatred run through the veins of this game. Yoko Taro had a clear vision for this project, wanting to say something. He wanted to deliver a message, one that he had been trying to get across since he started this series, and he does it so incredibly well. I will say that delivering this message does force some of the gameplay to take a back seat, as this story becomes the priority in a lot of ways. But honestly, I'm all for it. This game hits the sweet spot for me. It's something that can be played and understood as a director taking full control of a project. You can feel the passion in the story and the work. It's just there, and the thing pulses with the soul of the man who created it. The gameplay is the best we've seen so far in this series, even though it's still not perfect. There are large downsides to the combat, and they don't come close to being a full-fledged system with no flaws. It's still a massive step up from what we saw before, but the clunkiness of the system and the performance issues can really drag the game down. That being said, if we can see this project for what the vision was, then it's something truly special. What's presented to us is something unique and gut-wrenching, an emotional gauntlet that never stops pushing. The world can be quite confusing, and it only entirely makes sense once the entire timeline is viewed at once and all the supplementary material is consumed. If you're still confused, don't worry, we'll be looking at the full timeline once we wrap this entire series up. Drakengard 3 sold fine in Japan. The numbers definitely weren't anything to look at. Its first week saw it selling 114,000 copies, and it ended up selling 150,000 units in Japan by May 2014. The reviews were mixed. Some outlets gave it great scores, while Famitsu totaling a 34 out of 40, but the West didn't receive it as well. The game currently sits at a 61 on Metacritic. Most praised the story, saying the characters and dialogue were well-developed. The gameplay was also received positively, but most noted the dragon gameplay as being less than satisfactory. The graphics were the most criticized, as a lot of reviewers had screen-tearing issues and poor texture quality, as well as FPS drops. This was the last game released in the Drakengard series, but we can't talk about Drakengard without talking about its incredibly successful spin-off. This series had already had one entry by the time that Drakengard 3 would come out, and with this, we haven't even touched upon Yoko Taro's best works yet. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.